Welcome to episode 261 of Real Health Radio. You can find the show notes and the links talked about as part of this episode at 7. So the word all spelt out, S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 261. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. I'm your host, Chris Sandal. I'm a nutritionist who specializes in recovery from disordered eating and eating disorders, or really just helping anyone who has a messy relationship with food and body and exercise. So today on the show, it's a guest interview, and my guest today is Amy Greensmith. So Amy is a certified and credentialed life coach, hypnotherapist, masterful speaker, and personal empowerment expert. Amy uses her role as a coach, writer, podcaster, and speaker to move individuals to a place of radical personal empowerment and self-worth. With an acute focus on helping people find their voice, she is highly sought after for her uncommon style of irreverence, wisdom, and humor, and has been a featured expert in Inspired Coach Magazine and on Fox 5 San Diego. So I've known about Amy for a number of years. I've had Andrea Owen on the podcast a couple of times, and Andrea and Amy have both appeared on each other's podcasts, which is how I know of Amy. As part of this episode, we talk about Amy's relationship with food and her body. It's only in the last couple of years that Amy has discovered the anti-diet movement and health at every size. She's also someone who is in perimenopause and is seeing and experiencing body changes right now. So this was a very honest discussion with Amy being very open about the grief that has been coming up with all these changes and how she is in the, the messy middle place with acceptance. We talk about fear, something that comes up a lot for Amy's clients as well as with mine. And she talks about the four different fear responses from an evolutionary perspective and how these show up in our modern life. We chat about achievement and how to know if something is bringing you joy versus stealing your joy. This is a very practical episode, and so Amy shares lots of different exercises that she uses with clients about speaking up and setting boundaries, understanding our emotion, using progressive language, and the difference between I can't and I won't. And finally, we talk about hypnotherapy and what it is and how Amy uses it with clients. I really love this conversation. Amy has a huge amount of wisdom, and there are so many practical takeaways from this one. Amy does love a swear word, and I assume that most people when listening to my podcast aren't doing this with kids around, but if you are, just a heads up that this has more colorful language than the usual episode. I will be back at the end for a recommendation, but for now, here is my conversation with Amy Greensmith. Hey, Amy, welcome to Real Health Radio. I'm excited to be chatting with you today. Hi, Chris. I'm, I am pumped. I am excited. So in preparation for our conversation, I've been going through your podcast and the free materials that you have on your site, and there's really lots of directions that we could go with this. I, I'm definitely an over-preparer, and I have so many notes of things that I would love to touch on, like way more than we're ever going to get to. So I guess <laughs> we'll just like naturally see where this goes. To start with, do you want to give listeners a bit of background on yourself? So who you are, what you do, what training you've done, that kind of thing? Sure. Sure. Like, yeah, let's get all the, the like, kind of the boring <laughs> credentialing <laughs> stuff out <laughs> at the beginning. Uh, yeah. So I've been working as a coach and hypnotherapist for the last, gosh, 12 and a half years. I think I went... I originally went to coaching school in the mid 2000s okay. and uh, really officially launched my business in 09 and have sort of a, a bevy of different certifications along the way, neuro-linguistic programming, emotional freedom technique, inner child work. Uh, yeah, just sort of a, 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 as any good overachiever would do, just sort of amass all the certifications. But really what I do in the world and and what I think we're going to dig in a lot to today is, is really twofold. There's sort of an internal component of genuinely helping people believe in their own intrinsic enoughness, that internal self-worth, believing that you matter, that you have value, that you are deserving. We have lots of different vocabulary that we surround that with. And then there's this external component of, okay, if I genuinely believe in the person that I am and I love who I am and believe that I'm worthy, 
how do I now communicate with the outside world? So I focus very heavily on speaking up for yourself, establishing boundaries, how to say no, having difficult conversations, like what truly is the anatomy of a difficult conversation and how to kind of set yourself up for success. And so a lot of the literal words and semantics that we just we just are never taught, you know, like when yeah. in school are we ever taught how to have a difficult conversation really thoughtfully and empathetically. So that's kind of what I do I do in my little corner of the the interwebs. Nice. So I, I guess like I would like to go back sort of earlier than that and, and sort of start with with you and your your background in terms of like a lot of the work that I do with clients is connected to food and body and exercise and helping clients to improve their relationships in in these areas. I know you've spoken to Summer Inanen on your podcast and, and yeah. Lexi Kite on your podcast, and I've had them as guests on, on my show too. So I'd love to hear about your relationship with food and, and body and how this has evolved over time. So I guess like if, if we go back to you as a as a kid, how was food in your household or how was your relationship with food as a kid? Yeah, this is quite curious because I, I I'm fairly newly in a mid-sized body. So I've always been a fairly petite, small individual. So I, at this stage in my life, I'm grappling with a lot of body grief and, okay. and not only in uh, size, but also in age and in recognizing that, you know, I'm perimenopausal and there's a lot of days where I'm like, what is this? <laughs> where, when did this shit happen? And so there's definitely grief involved with that. But as far as the chronology of, of my life, I, I for a bit of context, I grew up in a very conservative, born-again Christian family. Okay. And there was uh, some real extreme issues with my mom around dieting. And she she is is still is in a fat body. And I say that with, you know, reclamation of the word fat. Yeah. And, but she has gone through as, as many boomer parents, I think did like constant dieting cycles. There was always something new. And I do remember my dad saying at one point, my dad was a very small in stature. He had uh, survived polio in the fifties. So he was quite fortunate that he could walk unassisted. Uh, and so he had his own sort of uh, body image issues to work with. But even as we grew up, he, he never claimed disabled, you know, and that was something that, I mean, obviously we see that constantly in our, our culture that glorifies health. Like we owe health to everybody. Uh, yeah. and, so there was sort of this repulsion around the idea of being a disabled individual. So we weren't, we were never taught really that that was the case. Like he would never have, you know, a handicap sticker on his car, you know, for example, like he didn't want to claim anything around that. However, it really did influence how he showed up in the world. And so he had three other brothers he was sort of in the middle and yeah. they would joke that he developed a really sharp tongue in order to kind of defend himself. And then his brothers would kind of have to be sort of the muscle behind the mouth and <laughs> would have to kind of fight his battles. And, and when they would bring that stuff up at like family, family gatherings and stuff, he was so mortified and really embarrassed about it. I think largely because he was teaching us so many, uh, he was teaching us the word of God, you know, I say as an atheist. And yeah. so he, I think, was embarrassed that that he was behaving non-Christ-like. But my mom, I know she was an only child. And so she was, she received a lot of pressure around weight, specifically from her father. And so all growing up, I know that she really, she was constantly doing Weight Watchers or Jazzercise or something and I do remember one specific moment when my dad was talking about her weight loss and he was talking about it really specifically through a very compassionate and empathetic lens, but 
it was a really hurtful thing. And he said, I just, I can't imagine what that's like to carry around an entire other body. It's like, it's like she's carrying around two people the whole time. And I know he was trying to be gentle with that, but I know that that was extremely hurtful for her. There was a lot of disordered stuff around hiding food. Uh, They would be stashed under her bed. There was lots of shame around that. Lots of rewarding, rewarding herself through food. Yeah. Uh, So very punitive, right? Yeah. And so I can remember for myself, I was always a very petite, small individual. And my grandma would always mention that like, oh, you're so tiny. You're so petite. When you were walking around when you were little, people were like, why is that baby walking? That <laughs> How is that baby walking? You know? So apparently I was quite small, but I do remember very distinctly, my very first diet was probably, I, th- I think I was probably, I don't know, 12 or 13. And it was around fat grams. So okay. I I decided I'm going to have this many fat grams. <laughs> and, uh, but actually, Chris, now that I'm thinking about it, I had a meltdown when I reached a specific weight that I could no longer ride these little go-karts that my cousins had that were made for children, right? Like they're made for tiny yeah. kids. And so I had reached the weight limit that was completely normal. Like, and, and I remember just having this meltdown that I was too big to ride this specific toy. Uh, But then it was sort of a a series of going through high school in the nineties with, with the waif model being, you know, emaciated being the main look and aesthetic. And so many of us didn't, fall into that category. And I remember Kate Moss, I was very, very into modeling and as a follower, it wasn't something Mm -hmm. that I did, but I followed a lot of fashion and stuff. And I remember Kate Moss coming into the scene and it being just such a disruption because she was one inch shorter than all the other models that were out there. Uh, So that was the sort of body disruption that was happening on the runway in the nineties was God forbid somebody was one inch shorter. So the idea of variation in body types, fat liberation, uh, celebrating disability, celebrating gender, celebrating queer bodies, like all of that stuff was not, there was one standard of beauty, right? And, And I was highly affected by that. I don't, I can't say that I had much pressure really from anybody in my immediate life other than, other than myself. Okay. And, and it's, yeah, it's been really interesting. I think probably up until about, it was at the start of the pandemic even. So this was probably just a handful of years ago where I, I started learning about diet culture and I started learning about what it meant to really feed yourself. And I kind of went, holy shit, we've been duped. <laughs> we have been bamboozled. And uh, and that's really when I started to say, like, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. And I'm not going to use language that supports that. And, you know, one of the ways that that shows up in in the work that I do now, you know, I have very few rules with my students, but I have two rules. One is you don't apologize for crying or being emotional. And the other is you don't apologize for what you look like. So you don't say, oh, I didn't do my hair today or, oh, you're catching me right off the, after the gym. We're not, we're not doing that. No apologies for your appearance. That's just, we have too much, too much other big shit to handle. Yeah. So yeah, a little bit about the chronology. Okay. And so like prior to the, the pandemic and, and when you were finding out about this, were, were you constantly dieting? Was it sort of on and off? What what did it look like for you? It was pretty constant. I've I've always been fairly active as far as fitness and things like that go, but I am not somebody who 
really loves exercise where I'm like, oh, I just can't wait to move. <laughs> so it it really has been something that I've had to figure out what intuitively feels good to my body. But yeah. as far as sustenance, oh, I was full, you know, my fitness pal tracker. I was constantly trying different things. And, and a lot of it under the guise of health, of course, like shocker yeah. and seeing various nutritionists and trying different strategies and maybe I should do whole 30 and maybe I should do uh, just the sort of the gamut. And yeah, it was, it was really exhausting. And I think one of the things that we don't, that doesn't get enough airtime is the idea that when we have largely women obsessed and taking up so much of their mental landscape and real estate around body and food, yeah. that's less time to create a fucking empire. That's a that's less time and mental energy to give to your relationships or to yeah. fight systems of oppression, right? And yeah. helps helps us stay in competition with one another, which we know is a tool of the oppressor. So yeah, I was very, very steeped in it. And I have to say that the last handful of years has been extremely grief ridden and yeah. have been working with my own therapist around that, but also with the tether between religious trauma that I've gone through and the connection with owning your body and trusting your body. Yeah. And that's been really pivotal for me that, you know, really early on, I was taught that, you know, the body is sinful and to kind of disassociate with with the body and that it's really for others consumptions not really for you and at the same time it's really sinful and something to be ashamed of and so there was so many different mixed messages not to mention that pleasure was really demonized so yeah. pleasure in food or pleasure in sex or in fun you know, it was about temperance and <laughs> and self-sacrifice, which which I find not only detrimental, but also highly abusive now at this at this stage in my life. So it's all quite tethered, right? It's all yeah. it's all a big fucking mess, which is why we do what we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how how liberating though has it been? Like I, I understand there's the there's the the worries when you first find this information or, or like how do I actually do this and that that feels scary. But at this point, you're you're a couple of years in, like how, how would you describe it now? Oh, you're probably not going to like this, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have a friend of mine who is about a year sober and from alcohol. And I have talked to her like, oh my gosh, do you feel so much better in your body? Are you sleeping better? Do you love it? And she's like, no, I fucking hate it. <laughs> she's like, it, I mean, it's good. There's definitely some good things about it, but she's like, I miss alcohol so much. Yeah. And, you know, I'm still continuing to make this choice, but she's like, I keep wanting to know when the payoff is going to be. And I think that's what we don't realize about how grief works. And yeah. that I'm still very much in the throes of grief. And there are certain things that I, I absolutely love. Like I definitely love not trying to calculate <laughs> what I'm consuming or measuring food out. Or if I have a get together with friends being like, oh, I already had a cheat day this week. What am I going to do if I go, you know, and just the yeah. angst around what am I going to eat? And so I definitely do not miss that, but good God, I miss a smaller body. I 100% miss a smaller body. And I've really been grappling with the space of, okay, Amy, that also means that you have fat phobia that you have not worked out yet. Yeah. And so really coming to terms with that of like, okay, as much as I would like to feel like I'm woke and understand all this stuff, I still have my own fat phobia that I'm, I'm dealing with. And here's what I will say is at the very beginning, I felt like the pull to come back to the dieting side, right? Like this tug of war 
Yeah. I felt the pull towards the dieting side so much heavier. And I kept kind of staying the course because there was this intuitive piece of me that was going, that has not worked. That has not led you to body acceptance or to yeah. feel good. And so I kept kind of going, okay, let me keep going to this other side of, of, of even body neutrality or uh, acceptance of what is or further educating. And I, in understanding how the subconscious mind works, I recognize that one of the pieces of changing our subconscious beliefs is around repetition. Yep. So I've been very, very diligent about what I consume, who I'm listening to, the type of podcast that I digest, what I, what I watch. So, and so keeping myself really aligned with, with the messages that I want to attach to. So I feel like I'm much, much more anchored in a, a body neutral place now. Yeah. But I'm definitely not done yet. Like there's, there's, there's still a lot of longing for what was. And, and it's not just size. It is, it's youth. It's feeling yeah. like, oh, wow, my face is falling down. <laughs> That's new, <laughs> you know, and, and recognizing that like, oh, okay. The older you get as a woman, if you're no longer able to be something for the male gaze, you become quite invisible. And so there's this real push pull of recognizing like, oh, I'm not getting attention or I'm not getting checked out anymore. And then the feeling of, hey, why aren't you oppressing me still? Hey, why aren't you looking at me like only a sexual object anymore? What happened to that oppression? I was used to that oppression. So, so there's a lot of reckoning with the gaslighting of that, you know? Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I can't say by any stretch that I'm healed, but I do think that as we evolve and grow as humans, we're kind of presented with new chapters or realms that we're able to dive into. So for example, when women come to work with me, a majority of what we are untethering is just this belief that they are enough. And yeah. when we can start creating that belief of I am worthy, it starts to have this ripple effect. And then inevitably what I see with them over time is now there's a new thing to process. So now it might be weight or now it might be relationship with money or it might be relationship with men or it might be relationship with religion. And so there's there's all these new levels of healing, but this is what I have feel very strongly about is healing is never on our timeline, yeah. whether <laughs> whether it's physical or emotional, right? Like how many yeah. of us have had an injury and we're like, I'm ready to be back up and running, right? And your body's like, bitch, slow down. We're <laughs> not ready yet, right? And the same is true about our emotional healing. So I get very fed up with that all the time where I'm talking to my therapist and I'm like, I'm so fucking sick of talking about this. And my healing is not on my own timeline, right? Like it's it's about continuing to take one step forward. Yeah. And so thank you for your very honest answer with that because I, I do think that it can be very easy to talk about this stuff in, in black and white terms. Whereas like, oh, before when I was dieting, all of these bad things were happening. Or before when I had my eating disorder, all of these bad things were happening. And now that I've recovered, all of these good things are happening. And it's like this very like uh, binary and like simple black and white dichotomy. And it's just not true. That's and right. like, you are going to get to a better place with this. I, I don't doubt that. And you're still going to have times where you are still grappling with this, because as you said, you are now aging. So there's going to be those things that you are, are knocking up against. And so, yeah, I, I think it's good that you've been able to share where you're at because that's the reality for most people. It's this kind of messiness with it all. And when you only present the kind of like concertina perfect bits of something, someone when listening to that feels like, oh, I must be doing it wrong. Like they've right. been able to figure this thing out 
And yet I just, I, I'm on board with some of it, but then I have this questioning about this other thing. And so, yeah, it's good to hear the richness of your experience where you're like, okay, I, I'm noticing these benefits. I intellectually understand these other things connected to it. And I'm still struggling with these components. And that's because I'm in the, in the grief process. That's right. And it's, it's really, it, it's a through line with all personal development Yeah, because I, I find that I will have students and clients who will think, okay, once I learn how to engage in a tough conversation or establish a boundary, now everyone's going to just do what I need them to do. And I'm like, oh, honey, fuck no. <laughs> there, there is some collateral damage. So it's not un, uncommon for me to see people who really, really struggle with people pleasing or being highly invested in the opinions of other folks that once they start speaking up for themselves, they start realizing how many individuals in their life actually prefer the doormat version of them. Yeah. And then there's grief and loss around relationships. And so I oftentimes will talk about it in the terms of dichotomous emotion, where on one hand, you're incredibly proud of yourself for voicing something that was problematic for you. But on the other hand, you're incredibly hurt or disappointed or feel a sense of obligation or, you know, any other number of emotions. So I really think that the more we talk about the human experience and what that looks like in the terms of our healing, whether we're talking about body image or anything else, that we really set ourselves up for success when we get out of this binary yeah. And I kind of like when I'm thinking about the the work I do with clients, I often think about it sort of in levels of like, okay, what what is the thing that is sort of most important or what are the things that are most important at this level that you're at? And then once that's accomplished, okay, okay, we move on to this this next level of things that that need to be to be worked out. And this is a, a kind of a collaborative thing of working out, okay, how we we do this and in, in what order, et cetera. But as you kind of talk about that, like if you get better with boundaries, the thing that then comes along with that is now I'm having to deal with this other problem that that brings up, even though there are benefits from setting boundaries. And I think that's important to realize of like, okay, I make this progression forward, but I now need to deal with this other thing that then comes along with this as a consequence of now kind of speaking my mind. 100%. And another sort of nuance in the personal growth space that I don't think gets talked about either is how we will take a certain concept like people pleasing, for example, and demonize it. So we'll say perfectionism is always bad or people pleasing is always bad. We want to get away from that. But let me tell you, if I have a heart surgeon who's working on me or a brain surgeon, I need them to be a perfectionist in that moment, right? So there's certain times when these concepts that get thrown out either are quite quite limited yeah. and and not as expansive as we need to give them or or we demonize or we say you always have to or never, always never. And with people pleasing in particular, I mean, it is rooted in a primitive defense mechanism. It is an iteration of our fawn response, which is a completely normal way to engage with impending threat. And, you know, if we think about sort of our our primitive ancestors, if you did not belong to a group, that meant that you would die. So, yeah. like, flash forward now when, you know, Susie in accounting doesn't like you, on a subconscious level, you're going, holy shit, if I don't please this person, I could die. <laughs> and of course, we don't consciously think that, but it registers in the brain as threat. Yeah. But there are certain situations, especially if you're in a marginalized identity or intersection thereof, that people pleasing 100% can keep you safe. You know, from, from my own personal experience, I identify as queer. And if I were to be in a group of individuals who were clearly violent towards the queer community, that's probably in my best best uh, interest to placate and just yep. for my own physical survival. So it's probably not the time for me to get on my microphone and go off, right? Because I can't do much 
much work for the resistance if I'm not here anymore. So I think really understanding that all of these things have have nuance to them. I mean, even the grief process, you know, David Kessler and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross were really hesitant to even have five levels to grief because they knew people wanted to check off the fucking boxes of it. Yeah. So I think recognizing that there's a lot of expanse to humanity inside all of these topics we're discussing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even with them, that the, it got extended to to seven levels, and then they said it's mm-hmm. not even it's not meant to be in order. But the same. I mean, it, we, people talk about comparison. You've got to stop comparing, and it's like we have an inability to stop comparing. Like that's right. We, we have evolved to compare because that again, it, it was important to understand what were the rules of the the hundred hundred twenty people we were living with, so that we could get along. Because if we were excluded, that meant death. And so, yes, we don't want to be paralyzed with comparison or have comparison have such an impact on our on our life that it has leads to lots of negatives. But the idea that we can get to a place where we are never comparing is just idealistic and and is nonsense. It's not going to happen. That's right. That's right. I mean, fear is another one, you know, our our inner critic that kind of jumps down our throat uh, is genuinely trying to protect us. It's kind of going, hey, wait a minute, we're embarking on new territory here. Yeah. Let's say you're you're starting a new business or you're getting back into the dating scene and your mind goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've never gone down this path before. This is new. Are you sure this isn't a threat? Let me send in all of this negative messaging. So it's kind of like, a best friend who has really shitty communication skills <laughs> and they think that you're always in danger and can't decipher when something's just new and when something's actually a threat. So yeah. let's send in the same artillery no matter what. And so, you know, I oftentimes will say that courage cannot exist without fear. So if you want to be a courageous, brave individual, it's about looking our fear in the face and choosing courage over and over again. So I, I've i always hated this term of being fearless because I just don't think it exists. And yeah. in fact, I think there's one documented case of a woman who did not have a fear response. And unless she is listening, <laughs> that means everybody else, you, you have to engage with fear and Truly what that looks like is not an absence of fear, but a choice of behaving from courage over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I imagine the, the the woman who was fearless, I doubt she made it that far in life because fear is uh, important to keep us safe. And there, there's yes. a great book that I'm blanking on the, the title. I think it's called the The Gift of Pain. And it was all about the, the research into leprosy and and the the problems of of why it occurs and and what they discovered was that you you lacked the pain receptors in in the body, and so mm-hmm. by not having the pain receptors, you would then put your hand into a fire or touch a hot stove or uh, something would be biting on you and you would not know or you'd have injured your ankle with walking and you didn't know and so you keep walking on it. And without that feedback, things get really bad really quickly. And I think it would be the same here. If we don't have that fear response, we are going to be in trouble. And so it's like, how do I manage that fear response? How do I kind of take the information that is useful from it and and put the other parts to the side? And so I I, like fear is something that comes up a lot. And I I know it's something that you talk about. And so I think you, you, there's like a four fear responses um, that you talk about. So yeah. Do you want to go through that? Sure. Sure. Yeah. And, and to your point, she, this, this gal who did not have the fear response. Yeah. She would just like walk in the middle of traffic and (laughs) stuff like that. So the same as what you were talking about with the pain receptors, it didn't, the threat, actual threat didn't register. So yes, we do, we do need it. So let's talk about that then. So our four primitive fear responses, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. And so these are most oftentimes associated with extreme threat. So let's take an example of 
being attacked by a mountain lion, let's say, okay? If you were to fight, right, you obviously are going to be aggressive. You're going to try to win. If you're going to flee, you're running away. Freeze, obviously, we know what that looks like. Fawning is something that's a little bit newer kind of on the scene yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, that we're talking about a lot more frequently. But fawning is basically placating. So that would be like, here, kitty, 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 kitty. Here's some, here's some nice meat. Go get it. Right. Like <laughs> you're trying to placate. You're kind of trying to acquiesce Yeah, an aggressor or a captor or, you know, an impending threat. Now, all four of these have modern iterations. So there are plenty of situations in our lives now where we are feeling a sense of threat in some way, but it's not necessarily an end of life situation. Like this mountain lion might maul me to death, but there are situations where we still register in the brain that it is unsafe. And this can be as simple as extreme deadlines at work right? Where yeah. you feel like if I don't do these things, there's going to be such a negative repercussion. So we know that the brain will scan for threat way more than it scans for pleasure because we're trying to stay alive, right? So these start to iterate over time. So our fight response also shows up now as anxiety, so if there are situations where we can't actually fight or tell the boss, no, I don't want to get that. I, you're asking too much for me and I can't get this done in time and we can't fight. <laughs> it will morph into a sense of anxiety. That is a message. These aren't yeah. necessarily negative things at all. In our society, they are, right? Because we hyper diagnose things and we want to just squash everything, you know, pop the pill or whatever. And I'm, no, and I do the same myself. So <laughs> no judgment, but we're not looking at our symptoms as messaging and yeah. uh, especially our emotional selves. There is a lot of information in how we feel, right? So if you are experiencing a lot of anxiety, there's probably a message there for you. Either that there's too much happening at work, there's too much happening in relationships, you're, you're demanding too much from your own body and physicality. There's something happening there and it's like, hey, 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 we need you to pay attention. So uh, the next one is, fl is flight, right? If we were to flee, the modern iteration of that is depression. This is oftentimes why you will see folks who are in extreme depressive states want to sleep constantly because it is a way to run away. It is a way to escape. But just like anxiety, it's a message. It's here yeah. to say, hey, I need you to pay attention. We're sending in this symptom so that you recognize there's things that need to be ad uh, addressed, right? Yeah. Yeah. Freeze most oftentimes shows up as procrastination. It can definitely have other iterations, but that's one one of the most prevalent ways that it shows up where we kind of, this also I see a very, very strong correlation with perfectionism, yeah. where if I cannot be flawless at something, I'm just going to stand still. Or I'm sure you've seen this to people who want to start their own business or become a practitioner or help other people. And they're like, oh, one more certification. Let me just get one more. Let me go to one more, one more school, one more this one. And let me just stay frozen in this space where I'm not really taking action on what I want to do. And so it creates sort of that, that freeze, that stagnation, that procrastination. And then the fawn response, the modern iteration of that is people pleasing. And like I mentioned before, there are some times when it's totally called for and when yeah. it will absolutely save you the same way it could save you from the mountain lion. But I would say far more often than not, especially as it relates to being invested in the opinions of others, far more often we are not actually in a highly threatened situation. We have just conditioned 
a defense mechanism that probably really served you well in your childhood. <laughs> Shocker. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like it a lot of times if you've developed a strong people pleasing tendency or sometimes we'll we'll say, "Oh, I just don't like conflict or I don't want to rock the boat." You know, we have all of these nice ways to say it. Like we we think it's nobility, but it's really poison. <laughs> We have all of these ways to say that, but it's likely that you developed that early on realizing that, ooh, you know, dealing with an alcoholic parent, maybe the best way for me to stay safe is walking on eggshells and making sure that they're okay and putting their needs first. And then you got to fly under the radar and then here you are in your adult life going, why are all of my friendships and work relationships walking all over me? Why can't I speak up for myself? So it's about figuring out when do any of these modern iterations show up for you in a way that they're actually not keeping you safe, but rather impeding where you want to go in your life, right? And, yeah. and really allowing nuance with all of them. Nice. And so when you're you're starting to do this work with clients, is the first step with this really just that awareness piece of just like, okay, what in what scenarios am I falling into each of these different four categories? Or is it likely that if someone someone has sort of like one category that they will typically fall into in in all situations? No, I think we're we're again, we're so vast as humans that, you know, you might really get a lot of anxiety and or a fight response around certain people in your family, right? Maybe you come from a family where you scream and yell and that's how you work it out. But at work, at work, that's not the culture that you're a part of. So you go into fawn when you feel threatened, okay. you know? So we have all sorts of different defense tactics depending on what type of threat we're experiencing, but yes, I <laughs> I think my my clients and students would wish that they had a dollar every time that they've heard me say awareness is the win because we can't do anything until we're really clear about what's happening. And I'll often give them this metaphor of <laughs> it's like we have been avoiding this one room in our home. And everything else in the house is nice and pristine and everyone can see all of these rooms, but not that room where we're not looking in there. And I don't want to see all the piles of shit that's in there. And then finally, it starts bursting at the seams of the door and it's starting to seep into the house and you just can't ignore it anymore. It's starting to affect the plumbing or it's starting to affect the all these other things. So you go in. And you turn the lights on and you are overwhelmed because in this corner, you see religious trauma. And in this corner, you see all of this uh, fat phobia and body image issues. Over here, we've got mom and dad. And over here, we've got work. And you just go, how on earth am I going to be able to sort through all of this? So the work that we do is to take each pile at a time and go, okay, let's work through this. Let's, let's get this out of the way. And eventually what we end up with after some time and effort is a pretty decently cleaned room. And then every once in a while, there might be some, some piles that start to kind of accumulate in the corner, but you yeah. are aware of it and you go, oh, I see you body dysmorphia. I see you eating disorder in the corner fuck no, I know how this goes. And I also have all of these awesome tools. So you can bust out your Swiffer and you can bust out your vacuum and you can bust out your organizational system. And that really is how it, how it works in personal development. It doesn't mean you're immune to developing more piles in that room. It just means that now you are aware of what's happening and you also have the tools to handle it much, much quicker. Nice. And I, I actually really like that as an analogy of like, okay, it's it's not a one and done thing. It, it is something that you you learn the skills, but you then need to keep keep working on it again and again and again. That's right. Well, I oftentimes will say it's a lot like tending to your health. 
Like, but we don't, we don't see personal development through that lens because we think we need to be fixed. So we think, okay, if I've had enough conversations about my childhood or about my body or about whatever, that I should get to a point where I'm done. And that's kind of like saying, okay, you're done drinking all the water you need to drink. (laughs) <laughs> or you're you're done with all the doc- the dentist appointments you have to go to. It's like, no, we're never going to be done with that. We have to maintain. And the same is true for our emotional well-being and our mental health. You know, that that stuff still needs your attention. And so to me, it becomes about not something that needs fixing, but just a new way of engaging with life, a new sort of operating manual, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And so, yeah, I think it would be useful to go through some of the different techniques that you use or, or, or exercises you do with clients or just other areas connected to, to all of this. And I know you recently had a podcast about just looking at what is kind of sustainable in terms of achievement, because I think achievement and, and what someone can do we have this kind of real hustle culture and and people should be doing more. And I don't think that really serves people particularly well. And and for a lot of clients, they are reaching this point of realizing that they are on the wrong trajectory and that they need to to switch or they've, they've hit a point of burnout or they're contemplating making that change because they, they just see what it's like at, at this point. And so I guess just like talking about, the difference between achievement that that fulfills you versus begins to to steal your joy. That's a great question and I think this can be applicable to anything that you have a value around. So if you have a value around achievement let's say essentially the way that I speak about value systems is that a value is a component that has to be present in your life in order for you to be fulfilled. For example, I have a value around creativity. If I do not have some sort of creative project going on, I can feel it emotionally. So the idea is that It's something that needs to be present in your life in order for you to be fulfilled. And the absence of that thing leaves you significantly less fulfilled. Now, the problem with values is that there is a very fine line between when it is incredibly fulfilling for you and then now where it's in control of you. Yeah. And what usually happens in that in control of me phase is we say, if I'm not accomplishing this thing, then I'm not worthy. Then I'm not valuable. So it's the collapse with our self-worth. So we're no longer saying, I would like to achieve this certain thing. Maybe it's a promotion, starting a business, writing a book, whatever. We're no longer saying that is something that I know will bring me joy. I'm lit up by that. Now we're saying I'm not valuable or enough unless I accomplish that thing. So now our worthiness is contingent on the accomplishment instead of that accomplishment fueling our life. Another sticky one around values is impact or philanthropy or caretaking for others. There are some folks who genuinely are lit up by caregiving, right? Yeah. But there is a very fine line of where that now is in control of you, where you don't feel like it's necessarily contributing to your joy, but now you've you've gone off the deep end into obligation. So yeah. really the answer with all of this stuff is having a really a clear understanding of what What do I value about accomplishment? So let's take that one in in particular. Is this something that I actually value? Or is it something that has been imposed on me by perhaps my family of origin, my culture, or even society at large? Is it a medley of both? Because that definitely happens as well. Yeah. And what relationship do I want to have to accomplishment? And usually what we can do with that is look at where have things been painful. 
So uh, I'll use a different value. So I have a very strong value on accuracy and precision. So I like when things are detailed and buttoned up and precise, right? And so there's times when that really serves me, when all systems fire appropriately with a client and they get all the information that they need. And then there's other times, Chris, when it's three o'clock in the fucking morning and I am going back and forth between one tiny little line on my website (laughs) and going, oh, wait, does that need to be moved over to the left or to the right? Is that now that's a situation where that's not actually bringing me joy. That's bringing me anxiety. That's bringing me overwhelm and stress. Yeah. So when I look at like, okay, that when does this value serve me? It serves me in these incidents. And then it is in control of me or steals my joy in these other situations. And really being clear about writing that out of like, here's the emotion of fulfillment around accomplishment, let's say, or here's the emotion of angst, discomfort, frustration, because as we were saying earlier, emotions are just messaging. They're there to tell you, hey, I think this value is getting a little bit out of control. I think you're collapsing all of your identity or all of your self-worth with this one particular achievement. So it's not to say you're wrong, you're bad. It's just to be like, hey, bitch, let's pay attention here a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. And I think the thing or one of the things that came to mind when you were saying that was where it feels like it it switches from being process-based to outcome-based. Like when the value is like, I'm enjoying doing this thing and being in the moment and I'm enjoying it for its own sake, that's great. And then when it becomes about, well, I have to do this thing because this is part of my identity or I have to reach this amount of money or I have to do this thing, like it becomes sort of outcome based. And I imagine that, or not, I imagine that that can then start to suck the joy out of that value. Well, I think this is another great opportunity for nuance because I do think that there's times when the outcome is so rewarding. Like if you, if anybody out there is a parent who had really a strong struggle with fertility and you finally get to the point where you're able to bring a life into this world or you're able to adopt or something, that outcome, my God, that makes the journey worth it. Right. So, you know, and I had a situation recently on a much smaller scale to talk about sort of that that value around creativity. My husband and I pretty much lose our minds around Halloween. <laughs> and so we build props from scratch and we have all these animatronics and we work on things for months. <laughs> and I mean, Chris, it's out of control. We're going to like a Halloween con in February. It's, <laughs> we might need an intervention. Um <laughs> But so the process of that, the journey of that is a blast. And the outcome of Halloween night, when we are able to showcase everything that we've worked on, is also fulfilling. Yeah. So I think the nuance, the place to look is, am I doing something either for an outcome that is for someone else's fulfillment? Yeah. Yeah. Or am I doing it for an outcome and I fucking hate the journey? Those those are the issues where I think we really need to look at, is that outcome actually worth it? Yeah. No, I definitely agree with you on that and, and having the the nuance with it. So yeah, that was that was good good for you, kind of bringing back the nuance. And so, yeah, one of the exercises that you talk about in in one of the handouts you have is what's my motivation? Are you able to kind of walk through this exercise? Sure. So the deal with how we are motivated as humans is we are typically either in the pursuit of pleasure or in the avoidance of pain. Those are the two major human drivers. So whatever we are going for or working towards is typically because we think it will either give us some sort of pleasure or will allow us to avoid some sort of pain, right? Yeah. So within all of that is human emotion, right? So what we usually are involved in or processing carry some sort of human emotion. And we've kind of been taught in our society that if it carries some sort of negative emotion 
or what I would rather say is a uncomfortable emotion. Yeah. Because I, I don't think it's necessarily negative. I just think it's uncomfortable that we go run away from that at all costs. Don't sit with it. Don't feel it. Don't don't recognize what's happening. So I think we don't necessarily notice that we can fuel our behavior from any type of motivator, whether it being an emotion that feels comfortable to us or a mission or a belief system or something that is of strong value to us. So it's not dissimilar to the idea of the glass is half full or if it's half empty. It's the same fucking glass, right? It yep. just has to do with how you are perceiving it. So the same is true with motivation. So you might recognize your behavior. You observe your behavior and notice what you did in your life, what, whether it's something you did or you did not do. And recognize what was the motivation behind that decision. And almost always it's tethered to some sort of an emotion. Not always, but but frequently. Yeah. So you could notice that, let's say you're at work and you chose not to speak up in a meeting. And so you're looking back at the end of the day and you're trying to categorize, what, what was my motivation of staying silent at that time? And what were the emotions that I was feeling? Hmm. Well, I was definitely feeling a sense of fear of and threat. Like if I were to speak up, what does that say about me? What does that mean about me? Am I being difficult? Am I being adversarial? Is it my place? All of that. Okay. What would that have shifted in that scenario if I would have been motivated by a value of impact or an emotion of competence? So we can choose any number of motivators. So yeah. if we were to look at that situation and do what I like to call declaring the do-over, where we say, okay, next time, if I were to go into that situation and just say, okay, I want you to behave from a place of confidence, or I want you to behave from a place of impact, What? how would your behavior be different in that scenario, Right. Yeah. And so it's a way for us to basically shift how we're looking at the glass. If we're used to looking at it half empty, okay, let's shift and say, what if it's half full? What if it's filled with whiskey? <laughs> what if it's my favorite tea? What? Oh, I'm going to drink every last drop, right? So it's just about switching your perspective and how you engage with life based off of your values and your the your desired emotions. And so when you're then doing that with, with a client, are you then having them say, okay, cool, I, I'm going to continue to role play this exercise in my mind so that when this comes up again, I'm going to feel like that person that values competency or, or values impact and, and it's just going to be an instant reflex or how, in terms of the actual change work, what is the next step? Yeah, that's a great question. So I oftentimes will say there's something internal and then there's something external. So the internal is how we're going to gas ourselves up, how we're going to speak to ourselves, how we are going to do maybe some, some power posing in the bathroom before we go into the meeting, right? It's the internal like cheerleader, you've got this sort of thing. And that might involve like journaling ahead of time or, you know, I have tons of different tools and tactics that I'll give folks. And then the external component is going to be, what does that actually sound like? And this is the thing that I tend to rehearse with students quite frequently. So if they are going to go into this meeting, let's use the same analogy, they're going into this meeting and what they really want to share is if they continue down the path that the company has been going down, that there are some severe impacts to their particular department. And they want to be really clear about that. So we'll have a full conversation about exactly what it is that they want to say. And then we'll talk about anatomy of that conversation and how that can actually be impactful. For example, if you refrain from using words like, you are always doing this, or when you send me these messages, if you remove that accusational tone and say something like, 
when emails get processed like this, or when certain things get communicated in this way, you're and you're phrasing it like that without saying you, 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 or your department. Yeah. It's it lessens the impact. So there's tons of different things like that around again, anatomy of conversation that will really set up. But one of my favorite tools is to it's called the new definition of success. And it's basically three columns. And so in the first column, you give yourself full freedom to want whatever you want about this ex- this specific experience. So if we're using the same example, in that first column, you might write, I really want to speak up for myself. I want to be heard, which obviously we cannot control. But this is just full reign to dial in your order with the universe. Yeah. I want them to see it my way. I want them to change the different protocols so that we can have a smoother impact. I want the, you know, blah, 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 all this stuff. Then in the middle column, you write all of the things that you can actually control. These are the things that I want to say to myself. As I go in there, I want to remind myself, your voice matters. I'm going to say over and over to myself, your voice matters, your voice matters, your voice matters. I want to handle myself with grace and kindness. I don't want to raise my voice. I want to control the the cadence. I want to speak slowly. I want to take deep breaths as I need to. I want to be kind and compassionate, right? Like these are the way, this is how I want to show up. And so that's sort of like a little vision boarding for what what you want that situation to be. And then in the final column, despite the outcome, my self-worth is defined by the following. And then you get to decide that because there is no fucking self-worth store that you can roll into and grab some enoughness. It really is. I mean, even if you look at the dictionary definition, it is one's own sense of self-worth. That means you get to call the shots on that. So in that final column, I say, even though I've, even if I make a mess of this, if I don't handle myself with grace, my worth is not contingent on this one scenario. My worth is already here, no matter what happens. And I can course correct. And I am defined by Anything you want to be defined by, my compassion, my tenacity, my kindness, my whatever. And so it's a way to go into scenarios where we are really highly invested in the outcome and to let go of the things that are actually not in our control. Nice. I I really, really like that. And, And I like it because I think it's applicable to so many different aspects. Like you're talking there about work, but I was, as you're talking about that, thinking about a client who's like, okay, I want to, I want to be eating more for breakfast. or I want to start eating breakfast because I haven't been doing that at this point. And we can still go through that, that same process of looking at, okay, what would you like it to be? be like what are the 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 fears that are coming up that are connected to that even if it goes badly how do you want to remember your enoughness like doing that kind of level of planning and and forethought to help have that be the best experience no matter what and then you kind of just rinse and repeat you're like cool let's now reflect on how that went and then let's do this again yes Yes. And I think what we don't give enough space for is the emotions that follow suit regardless of what happens, right? So yeah. let's say let's say you have a week where you are killing it on your eating of breakfast, right? Yeah. And so you have a subsequent emotion of pride and thrill. Now, in our culture, we go that must mean I'm valuable. That must mean I'm enough. And conversely, if we have an emotion that says, I should feel guilty, I should feel shame, I I am worthless, then we go, that must mean that that's true, that I'm not enough, that I am, am a sum of this one scenario, right? Yeah. So I think it's really important that we recognize that even if we have a a situation where we're we're kind of disappointed in ourselves or we're not 
that happy with how we conducted ourselves, or we do think we could do something better. To take those emotions and actually allow them to exist and just go, yeah, that's kind of disappointing. And not make the jump to that must mean I'm shitty. That must mean I'm not enough. That must mean I'm not valuable. It just means the situation sucks. It doesn't mean you suck. And yeah. that's going to carry that's going to carry emotion. So one of the examples I use is I used to do a lot of community theater. And okay. so I would go on these auditions and I would really, really want to get a specific part. And I would give it my all. And then I wouldn't get it, right? And that is going to incur some grief. That's going to incur some emotional processing. So I would just let myself be disappointed. I would cry and be upset and have that sadness, allow it to be there. But what I did not do was take that and make it mean that I'm not enough, I'm not worthy, I'm a shit human, I'm a that. No, it just means I didn't get something I wanted and that sucks and hurts and I just need to feel it. Yeah. Yeah, right? Dan, I mean, the, the, the kind of Brene Brown difference between guilt and shame, like I, I did a bad thing versus I am a bad thing. Uh, That's like right. Being able to, to realize that it is okay to be disappointed about something that happened and that doesn't sort of define who you are on, on some sort of universal basis. Yes. Yes. So one of the tools that I, I love to give folks around this in particular is a, is a concept that I call find my truth and it's an acronym. It's F M T. And then find my truth is like an easy way to remember the F M T and the F stands for what are the facts? The M stands for what am I making up? Yeah. And, and the T stands for what is the truth? And in some scenarios, you're going to have to define your truth yeah. versus someone else's truth. So in the example that I just gave, the facts are I gave my gave it my all. I went to this audition and they said, you're not getting the part. What am I making up? This is the part where we usually jump to conclusions and we go, I suck. This is where we allow the shame. I am wrong. I am faulty. I'm damaged, right? Instead of going, okay, well, what I'm making up is that uh, that I'm never going to work again or that I'm not enough or whatever. Then the truth is what you, it's like what you want to come home to. It's your authentic self. It's getting outside of that inner critic and saying, okay, the truth is I'm not defined by one fucking audition. The truth is I'm an incredible human. The truth is it hurts to not get what you want, right? Yeah. And then someone else's truth in that situation, their truth might be, and we don't know this, so this could be another thing that we're making up, but the truth could be the director doesn't think I'm that good or doesn't think that I'm enough. Yeah. That does not have to be my truth. But that could also be something we're making up. But it it can really be helpful in situations where the other person's truth is really clear. So, for example, you might have a client who's dealing with family who thinks that it's that it's an abomination that you're not dieting. Like how yeah. you're letting yourself go and, you know, all of those horrible narratives. And so if you're looking at this, you're going, okay, what's the truth? The The facts are my mom feels this way about diet culture and I feel this way. We feel very, very polarized about that. What am I making up? I'm making up that I'm a disgrace, that I'm not enough, that I'm the, the whatever, that I should just conform, that I should make her happy, that it's my responsibility to take care of someone else's emotions. What is the truth? The truth is I am allowed to make powerful decisions for my body. Full stop. Yeah. The truth and and whatever. And like whatever your truth is. But you might have to say, and my mom's truth is very different than mine. But yeah. I'm going to allow that to be hers. Yeah. It, it's not that you both have to be on the, the same page. You, That's right. you can be your own individual. And again, this comes back to the, the people pleasing piece. This comes back to the the, the kind of dealing with uncomfortable conversations or uncomfortable emotions, uh, but it doesn't negate the fact that you can have that truth for yourself. 100%. And so then that truth 
whatever you come to as your truth, that then becomes your new empowering self-talk. So in that scenario I just gave, your new truth or your new empowering self-talk might be, I am allowed to make powerful decisions for my body. Or I do not have to make excuses or I do not have to explain the choices I've made for myself, right? Like it could be, it could be any number of things, but that then becomes what you remind yourself of over and over and over again, because that, that, that discontentment with someone else not approving of you or not being on the same page as you, not wanting the same things as you, that's going to carry emotion. It's going to feel like guilt. It's going to feel like you're doing something wrong, but you're not. (laughs) I have a whole spiel on guilt, which we don't need to go into, but In those situations, it's like when I contend with those phrases from my mom saying shit to me about, well, this would all be simpler if you would just lose weight or blah, blah, blah. Those are the moments when I'm either out loud to her as a boundary or internally or both, I remind myself, you are allowed to make powerful decisions for your body. Or you say to her, my uh, discussing what I choose to consume is not something that's up for debate. And you shut that shit down, (laughs) which, you know, we could go into a whole thing around, around that, but yeah. So that's how you would operate with the, the find my truth tool. And for the find my truth tool, can, can, like you were, you were talking about there in terms of your, your mother uh, sort of externalizing it, but does it still work if you're, you're kind of using it for the inner critic and, and sort of internalizing it? If we're kind of thinking about, okay, I've got this. I know with eating disorder recovery, there's a lot of talk about like my healthy self and my eating disorder self. And so I'm wondering like if you think it would work for, for that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it definitely will because a lot of times what we do is we will take a certain set of facts that's going on. Uh, Like maybe you have an adverse reaction to a specific type of food that you consumed and that's the facts. The facts is this doesn't sit well with my system, right? I feel nauseated or I feel I get hives or something, right? Yeah. What, what am I what am I making up? I'm making up that I'm doing it wrong. I'm making up that uh my body is fighting with me. I'm making up that why that this has to be harder for me than it is for anybody else. What's the truth? The truth is you are figuring out how to have the most harmonious relationship with your body. And it's just communicating with you. The truth is my body is just communicating with me. All I have to do is listen, right? So yeah, you could absolutely use it internally as well. Nice. And kind of connected to this is like progressive language. So talk about what this is and and how it can be helpful. Ooh, I love progressive language. So this, this really has a lot to do with how the subconscious mind absorbs beliefs. So if you're not familiar, anyone listening, it's theorized that our conscious faculty of our mind is roughly like 5 to 12% of our mind's power. The subconscious is roughly 88 to 95%. Depends who you ask, right? But yeah. we can see that a large swath of our mind's power is going to our subconscious beneath our consciousness, right? And so what's housed in the subconscious part of the mind is our belief system, is our values, is our fight flight response, is um, our habits, right? So Oftentimes, when we try to consciously feed our mind with a positive mantra, like uh, you are allowed to feel what you feel, let's say, or I powerfully advocate for my own needs. Let's say that's the mantra you're trying to adopt. If there is a counter narrative in the subconscious that says staying silent is safer than being vocal, it guess which one's going to win? And so, and the subconscious sends in the guard dog, which is the inner critic that says, that's bullshit. You can't believe that. That's not true. You can't, you can't advocate for your own needs. So this is why when we try to use empowering mantras that are such a leap from where we are right now, the inner critic is doing its job going, Hey, that doesn't compute with what we know to be true. 
Yeah. Pe- people pleasing is safe. What are you talking about? Well, one of the things that changes the what beliefs and uh, what's held in the subconscious faculty of the mind, one is repetition. We talked about that earlier. Yeah. Uh, another is hypnosis. But another major piece of it is that there is not such extreme cognitive dissonance. That's what's happening. Cognitive dissonance is just when we're tr- trying to hold two opposing belief systems. One is in the conscious, one is in the subconscious. So if we are using something like progressive language, we're making it more palatable for the conscious mind and for the subconscious mind so it doesn't send in the inner critic. So what is progressive language? Instead of saying something like, I powerfully speak up for myself, or I am capable of making healthy decisions for my body. And you're like, fuck, no, I'm not. Or like, (laughs) you know, your instant gut, like kickback is like, no, that's never going to work. Progressive language is where we say something at the beginning of the statement, like I'm exploring what it looks like to speak up for myself, or I'm on my way to nurturing a healthy relationship with my body. Any type of semantics like that, it's like it uh, gives that little guard dog of the inner critic, it gives it like a little treat. (laughs) And it's like, okay, boy, like just, just settle down there a little bit. And so the subconscious is like, all right, okay, I'm listening because it's not so far-fetched. It's not so incongruent with what's happening. You're like, I can get, I can get on board with being on the way to changing something. So language like I'm exploring, I'm entertaining, I'm relearning. So it's it really is honoring the journey. And it also allows you to start changing some of those scripts yeah. in a way that's much more palatable for your mind. Nice. And, and I kind of am doing this a lot already with clients uh, around their goals. And so we, we'll talk about, okay, what is something that you want to want to change? And, and again, it could be the, the breakfast example. And the thing that then comes up for, for them is like, but like, how am I going to be able to do that forever? Like that just feels like so much of a, of a, of a big change and a big thing in the same way as you're, you're saying like, there's this kickback from the inner critic. And so we can then talk about Let's just, this is an experiment. You're you're doing it for a day or a couple of days or two weeks, whatever. It's an experiment. This isn't a permanent change. You're just having a look at this. Like, let's let's do this experiment, run run it. What is the data? What is the feedback that you get? What do you notice? What was helpful about this? What was not helpful about this? Like, it, it becomes a lot less threatening when it's, we're doing this as an experiment versus you are now making this change. And for the next however long it is that you're going to live, you're going to have to keep this thing up. That's right. Yes. I will oftentimes use a visualization of, I want you to imagine that you are watching yourself as you're going through this process, watching yourself on a movie screen and observe that character. What do you think she's feeling or he's feeling? What's what is motivating what they just said? And so you're examining sort of what happened for you. And this is the same with the what you just talked about, whether it's changing foods or how we're engaging with food. Okay, what was happening for that character? And it's so much more voyeuristic. And we can kind of give a much more objective assessment without judgment and go, oh, okay. So I think that character was really motivated. She's still rooted in some fat phobia or she's definitely got some diet culture stuff. I can see that there's sort of an emotion of shame that's coming up. I think there's probably some religious trauma that's happening, right? And so then when you're giving that little assessment, you can go, okay, you know what? I think what I need to do is I, I think I need to journal a little bit about the correlation between my religious upbringing and pleasure in food right? Like, so, but, but that's really difficult to do when you're standing inside your own body, shaming it to death, going, why did you fuck up the assignment? Or I can't imagine getting to that point or, uh, uh, no, if it's just an experiment, just watch a show, just watch a little, watch a little video in your mind. That can be a little more difficult if you're not super visual, but, um, 
but even like like what you're saying, sometimes I'll do sort of a scientific perspective, almost like you're being, you know, those, uh, I, I guess it's not really a two-way mirror. It's a one-way mirror and then one person can kind of see through it. It's almost it's like if you like, were, like police shows where, where they yes. got the, the, yes, okay, yep. Right. So almost like you, you're standing there with a little clipboard and you're observing the subject, right? Yep. And and just going, hmm, it appears that the subject is experiencing a lot of this. And we had <laughs> some yeah. shame surface over here. And then you kind of go, oh, okay, so here's the items I need to bring up with my therapist. Here's what I need to talk to Chris about. And, and it becomes a lot easier to dissect and move forward. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think any anytime you can find a way around it feeling like this is about me i think sometimes i would like okay let, let's imagine that a friend was coming to you with, with this thing going on and, and lo and behold their experience is, is similar to yours what what advice would you have for for that friend and it's amazing the amount of information someone can come up with when it's about a friend as opposed to it feels like you're about to ask me to to do all of these things that's right <laughs> Yes. And so another another thing that you you talk about is like the difference between I can't and I won't. And I yeah, I really love this. And so yeah, talk talk about this. Yeah. So <laughs> I I have often thought, okay, a lot of times we will say I can't when what we really mean is I won't. So we'll say something like I I can't possibly not text my ex. Like I just have to, right? And what it really is, is it's, and I won't. So I can't is really reserved for something that's, at least in my mind, is reserved for something that's not humanly possible. So I can say, I can't sprout wings out of my back and go fly around the neighborhood, right? Like that's not humanly possible. That's an accurate statement. I can't. Yeah. But saying I can't make peace with my body or I can't create a thriving relationship with food. No, you are actually humanly possible. That that is humanly possible. What you're saying is I won't. So I would really encourage you as an exercise, as you're going through your life, when you hear yourself say, I can't, ask yourself, is this not humanly possible or is this a matter of I won't? And I think more often than not, you're going to find that it's the latter. And so how is this then coming up with clients or, or where where do you then sort of use this a lot with clients? It really depends. But in my in my world, it's almost always around speaking up or having a tough conversation, establishing a boundary. It's, oh, I, c- I can't tell him that. I can't say that. I I don't think I could ever be honest about that. And I'm like, can't or won't. And a lot of times what that is, and I again, I see this very disproportionately with women, is there's this belief that it's important to take care of everyone else's emotions over my own. So if anyone else is going to incur pain or hurt, that I am responsible for that and I need to mitigate it and rectify it at all costs. So what that means for many of my clients is that they will lean on the crutch of I can't when really they absolutely are capable. It's just that they won't because they don't want to deal with having to really sit with that idea of I've always believed that I have to take care of everybody else's emotions. Who am I if I let go of that? Right? So it's there's a lot to unpack, yeah. <laughs> but that, that's how it shows up typically for me. Okay. And so what about hypnotherapy? So th- this is something you kind of made reference to in, in terms of your your training. So yeah, talk about how you use this with clients. Like when, when do you use it? What What is like, I, I haven't really done or covered hypnotherapy on the podcast before. So, so kind of you, you have stage to just talk about it um, be, being the expert. Sure. So I think what we don't realize about hypnosis is that really all that it is, is a slowing down of the brainwave state. So when we are awake, our our brain waves are at a specific kind of currency or speed. And as we go to sleep at night, 
they will start to slow down. We pass through a brainwave state that's called theta. And then when we go to sleep, we are in full delta brainwave state, meaning that they've slowed down considerably. Now, what's important to understand about this is that that middle ground between asleep and awake, again, just a slowing down of the brainwaves, when you're in that theta brainwave state, that inner critic, the little guard dog between the conscious and the subconscious goes to sleep. So what that means is if I'm feeding things to somebody in hypnosis, there's not a an extreme amount of kickback. So that inner critic isn't going, that's dumb. That's not true. You, you're not really in a forest right now. You're not picking things. You know, it's, it's totally asleep. <laughs> so it's a highly, highly suggestible. So it will allow messages into the subconscious at a much faster rate than if we were trying to do that in our waking consciousness as we're engaging in our life. That's why it takes consciously extreme repetition. And that's why so many of us throw in the towel because we don't have, we don't have the stamina and it's not really realistic to have all of that repetition in order for something to anchor into the subconscious. So it's what it feels like. Yeah. I think many people probably have had this experience where if you are driving somewhere, let's say, and you get to your destination and you're like, holy shit, I do not remember any of that drive. And that means you were in a hypnotic trance. So your subconscious mind, which houses habits and beliefs, you know, and all that familiarity knows exactly how to get to your destination. It knows how to drive. You don't have to tell your subconscious how to drive. It's already embedded in the habits, right? So yeah. It gets you where you need to go, but your conscious mind is going over, oh, I can't believe my mom said that to me. I need to, I wish I would have said this. I wish I, well, what am I going to do about it, right? Conscious mind's all fucking active, but the subconscious is like, I got you and get you exactly where you need to go. So we, we go through it naturally at least twice a day. Most of us do it more frequently. You can go into hypnotic trance just when you're reading a book or watching a movie when you're kind of transported, but we go through it naturally as we awake and as we go to sleep. So one of my favorite little tactics that I'll do is as I'm starting to go to sleep, I've noticed when I'm in that phase and you know, the more I practiced it, the more in tune I got with it, but I can feel when I'm in theta. And that's when I'll just say all the positive mantras that I can say. <laughs> so I'm like, you're fully capable of speaking your truth. You are a powerful, badass bitch or whatever. Like that's when I'll just repeat those things in my mind to help them slip in a little easier. But the way that it shows up with clients, um, I do a very specific program with folks. And so the, the program has nine different modules and each module has an accompanying hypnotic track that goes with it. But something that I think gets missed a lot in hypnosis and in meditation in general is sensory acuity. So yeah. not everybody is visual despite how our our society kind of thinks that everyone is. So not everybody can do guided imagery. In fact, it's incredibly frustrating because as you're trying to see this forest and find your happy place, you're like, I cannot see a goddamn thing. Now, we know that everybody's capable because we all have our senses. If you are a seeing individual, you can visualize. But it does not mean that that's your preference. It could be that you tune in way more to the kinesthetic and how things feel. You could be highly audio digital, which means that it's basically words and voice. So hearing statements or mantras or empowering um, conversation in a hypnotic trance is more therapeutic and healing for you. It could be, yeah, it could be more auditory. It really just depends. So what I make sure to do is when I present these hyp hypnosis tracks that accompany the modules is I try to make them where they could work kind of for any sensory acuity because that's, that is one thing I see all the time where people are like, ah, meditation doesn't work for me. And I'm like, I mean, 
okay. <laughs> we all, we can all do it, but a lot of times people have been given it in a package that's not congruent with them. So yeah. they think they're the one that's wrong when, uh, when there's so many right ways to do it. So, um, so yeah, that's how, that's how it kind of shows up in my work. No. And so are you with those modules and the, the person then listening to that again, are they listening just as they're about to fall off to sleep? Uh, yeah. So you, you can do, you, I, I always give them two options. I'll give them one track that fades to music so that they can listen just as they're going to sleep, which your subconscious mind can still hear even if you're asleep, but it just doesn't feel as effective to you because your conscious mind isn't looped in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we do like a little bit of, of some consciousness there, but what I do in the tracks typically is I will put binaural beats into the track that are designed to mimic the theta waves. So it helps get you into that trance state, no matter what time of the day it is. Okay. So that it, it really, it honestly doesn't matter. In fact, I'll tell people as long as you're not lifting heavy machinery or driving, you can listen to it on low while you're cooking, while you're, you know, putting your makeup on, while you're doing laundry, whatever, because the subconscious mind can hear it consciously. Again, that five to 12% is just going to be focused on the dishes or focused on the task at hand or whatever. And the subconscious is like, oh, I hear what's happening back here. So it can actually be more advantageous to have the, the conscious mind distracted. So there's a lot of right answers with that. Okay, cool. Well, that that's good to know because as you were talking about that, I, I was thinking about my own experience. I, when I am listening to something, I am so focused on listening to that thing that I become fully conscious of it. Like I, I the, the thought of putting something on and then falling asleep to it. Five hours later, I will still be listening to that that thing. Like I, I, <laughs> it feels like I have an inability to fall asleep while listening to something. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think maybe having something that is distracting me within in the present, whether that is I'm driving, trying to drive a car, uh, or not trying to drive a car, I am driving a car, or like something that is is keeping my conscious mind more active. Well, that's the only caveat I would say is do almost anything except drive a car, <laughs> okay. except drive a car or heavy machinery. I would just say really anything else, but there's also such thing as a flow state. Yeah. And so you can be doing like full on aerobic activity and be completely in a hypnotic trance. Like it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating. But my first question with you, when you said that is, Ooh, is there a hypervigilance for you around I can't I can't miss something or it's not safe if I don't if I miss something? I I would just be really curious of of your history with that. Um I it I mean, it, it, at least on the surface it doesn't feel like that's that's the thing okay. but may, maybe maybe I'm wrong. I just I maybe I'm just so auditory that when yes. I have, and, and this is especially the case is if I have something plugged into my, into my ear. So if it's coming out of speakers, it's different to if I'm wearing, uh, ear pods. But if, if I'm wearing something in my ear, I am so attuned to what I'm, I'm listening to that, that, but it, yeah, it doesn't feel like it comes from a place of fear or worrying. I'm going to miss something. I just, that feels like it is the most engaging way for me to consume content. I'm, I'm huge into music. I spend so much of my time listening to music. And so maybe there is some connection there, but interestingly, I can have music on all the time and work to the music, but, and that can go into the background quite well, but there's something about talking specifically that, that kind of messes with me and, and just doesn't allow that to happen. Yeah, that's it. So I, yeah, based off of that, I would just say, yeah, you're probably just have a very, very strong sensory preference of auditory stuff. Yeah. And um, you would probably really, really benefit from subliminal messaging that actually sounds like for the most part, just sounds like music. Yeah. But there's voices layered beneath it. And we we do that in my program as well, where, you know, the the week where 
well, I guess it's it's more like the month that we focus on belief systems. Yeah. My students will craft new beliefs and then we have them made into a subliminal track. So they're able to just listen to that all the time. It just sounds like music. But beneath that consciousness is are, you know, are all of the new belief systems that they want to attach to. So, but I would also argue that you probably are very much in hypnosis because some some people everybody experiences it differently um yeah. and and the students in my class they they do get some one-on-one sessions so sometimes we'll do hypnosis you know live on a specific issue or something that they want to do yeah but yeah i i think you could you could really really benefit from sort of that that subconscious piece of it and having it be subliminal Okay. That's it. I, I didn't know of that. So that's super interesting and something I will, I'll look into. Like I even just as I'm thinking about this, like my ability to recall information that I've listened to is, is really high. And I can even like place where I listen to it. So I can think of a particular podcast episode and mm-hmm. I can know where I was, where I, when I listened to that episode. Um, like if, I, if I'm walking somewhere or whatever. So th- there is something about auditory that is just really gets imprinted on me. Yeah, I would want I would think that that would be sort of the auditory equivalent of being photo having a photographic memory. So yeah. I was just trying to think I was like maybe that's audiophonic. I'm like what would that be called? But yeah. but yeah, I would think that that's the exact same same sort of thing of like you know there people say like oh I can see exactly what that statement was on a page. And yeah. you're doing the exact same thing, just with a different, a different sense. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's I mean, it's not a, it's not 100 percent perfect, but it, it's it is pretty amazing. Like I listened to that podcast four years ago, and I know I walked over that bridge when I was listening to that podcast. Yes, yes, yeah. And of course, we all have access to to all of our senses, but there usually is one that's kind of more more prevalent and that we tend to favor. Yeah. And in our in our culture we tend to assume that most people are are visual. So a little test that you could do for yourself is if you hold up your hand directly in front of your face, maybe about like a foot a foot in front of your face. Yeah. Um so directly at eye length and you close your eyes and and see if you can see a picture of your hand. Like, do you, can you still see what, what that looks like? Not particularly um, well. <laughs> right. So that's always my clue really quickly that somebody is probably not heavy on the visual. Yeah. But as I mentioned, people will experience hypnosis completely differently. And one of the ways people experience it is hyper, hyper awareness where you could hear a pin drop. You can hear any little sound that's happening in the in the room. My guess is that would be the case with you. And yeah, yeah it just means that's how you that's how that's how you theta, babe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or I mean, even just thinking about it, if if it is if the auditory is paired with with visual, then that then that works. Like my my recall for movies is pretty good. Um, mm. in, in a similar way, I can remember where I watched particular movies or, or remember a lot about films, even if I've only seen them once 20 years ago. Yes, yes. That's so cool. It's so fascinating to me. I I am not that way. <laughs> and I'm also increasingly not that way as I've aged. <laughs> like yeah. I used to have such better recall and memory. And I'm like, well, all right. This is just part of how it shifts. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, it's hilarious. My wife knows the the lyrics to so many songs, but when I ask her what is the song, she's like, I don't know what the song is. I'm just singing it. Um, and <laughs> she she has terrible recall of of movies where she she will get halfway through something and she's like, I think we I've seen this. I'm like, Yeah, we watched this three years ago. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I can I can do I'm I'm a bit like your wife in that way, but I do have a superpower in knowing and recognizing certain characters and being like, oh my gosh, they were in that one show in the 90s. <laughs> and my. I'm pr- I'm pretty good with the names. And my husband does that that thing where <laughs> uh, he will constantly 
mess pe- mess up names kind of like what what we think a middle-aged mom would do like of <laughs> of pop culture <laughs> references my husband does that so he'll be like Oh, that's Chris Stapleton. And I'm like, babe, that's Chris Pine, you know, or <laughs> something like that, like where he, he just messes it up all the time. It's the best. I always tell him, I love that you came with this feature. It's so <laughs> fun. <laughs> but, Amy, this has been a really lovely conversation. Where where can people go if they want to find out more about you? Yeah. So my corner of the internet is over at amygreensmith.com. All of those names are spelled kind of the basic bitch way. (laughs) Uh, Green with no E at the end, amygreensmith.com. And uh, like any self-respecting Gen Xer, I hang out the most on Instagram. You can find me under the handle, Hey Amy Green Smith. And under that handle, pretty much on, on all social platforms. But over over on my website, as Chris mentioned, I've got tons of freebies. I've got some hypnosis tracks over there. I've been doing my own podcast for almost 10 years, tons of stuff there, a free workbook for you. So just come over and hang out and, and grab yourself some loot. Perfect. Well, I will put all of those links in the show notes. And yeah, thank you once again for coming on the show. Oh, absolutely. It was a pleasure. So that was my conversation with Amy Greensmith. I really love what she has to say. And so if you enjoyed this conversation, then please check out her podcast and get the free guide from her site because there's lots of useful exercises in there that we didn't get to cover. So I have a recommendation that I want to make of something to check out. It is a British film called Brian and Charles. And a friend sent me the trailer for this a couple of months ago, and I've been looking forward to watching it for a while now and finally got the chance to. The film is about Brian, who is a single guy in his mid-40s or late 40s. He lives in rural Wales, and to fill his time, he makes lots of different inventions, and none of them are particularly useful. And then one day, he invents a robot that comes to life and is called Charles. And this could sound very futuristic, but it is not. The robot is made out of an old washing machine and it looks like something out of a bad 70s sci-fi show. But it's actually this kind of budgetness that makes the whole film really endearing. And it fits with the feel of how this lonely guy has little money and is just kind of scraping by. But while the robot feels very budget, the film is actually beautifully shot. It is really well acted. There's this real heartwarming story of love and friendship. It's super quirky with this offbeat style of comedy. And it kind of just reminds me of of other British films or even Australian films for when I was, was growing up. But it is a great watch and is called Brian and Charles. So that is it for the show. I will be back next week with another episode. Until then, take care and I'll catch you soon.